tonight at 10, for the first time, Boris Johnson admits he did attend a drinks party at number 10 during the first lockdown. He went to tell MPs he regretted what happened, but he still insisted the gathering in the garden was a work event. I regret the way uh, the event I have described uh, was handled. I bitterly uh, regret it and wish that we could have done things differently. And I have uh, and will continue to apologise for what we did. But many MPs were incensed by the Prime Minister's suggestion that the gathering had been within the rules in a technical sense. The party's over, Prime Minister. The only question is, will the British public kick him out? Will his party kick him out? Or will he do the decent thing and resign? Yeah. The Prime Minister faces a moment of great peril, even calls to quit, coming from MPs on his own Conservative side. Yes, we'll have the story of a tumultuous day at Westminster and the growing pressure on the Prime Minister. Also tonight, Prince Andrew fails to get a civil case dismissed in the US, which accuses him of sexually assaulting a teenage girl. The company that owns British Gas warns that soaring energy costs could be with us for the next two years. And a victory over Spurs takes Chelsea to the final of the Caribou Cup at Wembley. And coming up in the sport on the BBC News Channel, chaotic scenes at the Africa Cup of Nations as the referee blows full-time five minutes early in the Mali game against Tunisia. Good evening. For the first time, Boris Johnson has admitted that he did attend a drinks party in the Downing Street Garden at the height of the first lockdown. In a packed House of Commons, the Prime Minister apologised and said he understood the rage felt by those people who'd obeyed the rules at that time and in some cases were unable to be with loved ones when they died. But he went on to infuriate many MPs by suggesting that the gathering had been technically within the rules because he believed it was a work event. The Labour leader, Sakia Starmer, said the Prime Minister had run out of road. He said his defence was ridiculous and offensive and called on Mr Johnson to resign. And that call was later echoed by the leader of the Scottish Conservatives. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, has the story. A mess. There is no other word. The Prime Minister belatedly trying to clean up. <laughs> with an admission of possible rule-breaking an apology from a weakened leader. But will the answers to today's Prime Minister's questions see Boris Johnson through? Mr Speaker, I want to apologise. I know that millions of people across this country have made extraordinary sacrifices over the last 18 months. And I know the rage they feel with me and with the government I lead when they think that in Downing Street itself the rules are not being properly followed by the people who make the rules. There were things we simply did not get right. And I must take responsibility. Claiming to disbelief in the Commons that technically a bring your own booze organised drinks event was within the lockdown rules. Even if it could be said technically to fall within the guidance, there would be millions and millions of people who simply would not see it that way. Well, there we have it. After months of deceit and deception, yeah. the pathetic spectacle of a man who's run out of road. Yeah. His defence, his defence that he didn't realise he was at a party. <laughs> it, it, it is so ridiculous that it's actually offensive to the British public. Labour able to mock the unusually subdued Tory showman. When the whole country was locked down, he was hosting boozy parties in Downing Street. Yes. Is he now going to do the decent thing and resign? Yes. I, 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 re I, regret, I regret very much, I regret very much that we did not do things differently uh, that evening. The Prime Minister pretended that he had been assured there were no parties. Yeah. Now it turns out he was at the parties all along. Yeah. Can't the Prime Minister see why the British public think he's lying through his teeth? Yeah. 
Mr. Speaker, it's, it's up to the right honourable gentleman to choose how he uh, conducts himself in this, uh, in this place. There was derision, laughter at the Prime Minister's defence. Six questions later, election winner Boris Johnson looked defeated. This is not just a Westminster drama. It's exactly midday. We are heading over to Westminster where Prime Minister Boris Johnson... It was the must-watch from the morning sofa. The country seeing repeated calls for Boris Johnson to quit. Will the Prime Minister, for the good of the country, accept that the party is over and decide to resign? Do the decent thing and resign. Do the honourable thing and resign. He must resign. And the concern on his own side is potent. The number of MPs saying it's over for Mr Johnson, growing in the shadows. And calls for him to quit out in the open now. I explained yesterday. Even uh, from the MP uh, who is also the leader of the Conservatives in Scotland. I explained to the Prime Minister today that, that I felt he should stand down because of this, um, but that is ultimately his decision. But do the Conservatives, does the country, really have the appetite for more political turmoil? There was a sprinkling of supportive messages, some loyal friends in government for Mr Johnson too. What is needed above all is a, a, a doubling down, a determination to rebuild the trust between the government that the Prime Minister leads uh, and the British people. Boris Johnson's admission and apology in there has bought him a little time. A pause until the report into what did or didn't happen in number 10 is complete. Yet for many on his own side, he's already lost the benefit of the doubt. Growing numbers of his own MPs want him out, discussing frantically how and when his exit could happen. It is not inevitable, though, that he'll be hastened out of office. But it's no longer impossible to imagine that the Prime Minister might be gone before too long. Look at this, it's a fantastic garden you got here. Look at that. This is a... It is indeed a beautiful garden. This was, a, this was a, a, a former bomb crater. A place the Prime Minister was happy to show off in days gone by. Do you, think that you'll, do you see yourself being here for the very long this term? Is, uh, uh, well, we're, we're working very hard, Laura. But his time in residence could be brought to an early close by what happened literally in his own backyard. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. Well, the official inquiry into a series of alleged parties held during lockdown in Number 10 and other parts of Whitehall is still going on. But it's not known when Sue Gray, the senior civil servant in charge, will release her findings. Our deputy political editor, Vicky Young, considers the political fallout of the last few weeks and months. It's been a disastrous few months for the Prime Minister and he stood here today accused of deception, of treating the British people with contempt. Some on his own side think this could be a tipping point that leads to his downfall. But this is a man who's recovered from setbacks before and Cabinet colleagues are rallying round. I think it's right, as he was saying today in the House of Commons, that Sue Gray is given the time to conduct that investigation. There'll be a full counting of them. The Prime Minister will come back to the House of Commons. That's the right way to handle this. And Sue Gray is a senior civil servant who spent years in Whitehall as the head of propriety and ethics. She'll be investigating a long list of allegations that Covid rules were broken in Downing Street starting during the first lockdown in 2020. A photo taken on May the 15th showed the Prime Minister, his wife and staff in the Downing Street garden with bottles of wine and cheese. When asked about it, Boris Johnson said those people were at work, talking about work. A few days later, about 100 people were invited by email to socially distance drinks in the Number 10 garden. Today, the Prime Minister admitted he attended for around 25 minutes. And on the 15th of December, multiple sources told the BBC there was a Christmas quiz for Number 10 staff. Boris Johnson took part remotely, but others gathered in one room. A video obtained by ITV News showed the Prime Minister's then Press Secretary Allegra Stratton joking about reports of an event on the 18th of December, saying... This fictional party was a business meeting. <laughs> and it was not socially distanced. Those that worked with Theresa May in Downing Street say clawing back support can be difficult. The issues that this government is suffering from at the moment are all self-inflicted wounds and are about the way in which the Prime Minister is running his government. It's not clear to me that he is ever going to be able to fully recover his reputation from what's happened. Uh, but the starting point 
I, I think, has to be to get all of the facts out there, to be completely honest about what has happened. Conservative MPs wanted Boris Johnson as their leader because they thought he could win them elections. Brexit and his unique campaigning style made him a vote winner. But governing brings different challenges. The endless scrutiny, having to watch every word you say, and some fear that it's his flawed judgment that's now being exposed. And on that, his former closest adviser, Dominic Cummings, has become his harshest critic, accusing him of not being up to the job. For months, there were questions about how Mr Johnson paid for a lavish refurbishment of his Downing Street flat. His standards adviser said he'd acted unwisely. And then, when former Minister Owen Paterson was involved in a row over sleaze, he tried to change the rules to protect him. Backtracked. One. And the Lib Dems then won the safe Tory seat. Boris Johnson's authority has been severely dented, and all this a huge distraction from the policies he promised to deliver. Vicky Young, BBC News, Westminster. Well, as the pressure mounts on Boris Johnson at Westminster, uh, some MPs are reporting deep resentment among voters in their own constituencies. Our political correspondent Alex Forsyth has travelled to the Conservative seat of Wolverhampton South West uh, to find out what people are saying there. Mr Speaker, I want to apologise. Prime Minister's questions isn't usually a blockbuster event at this boutique cafe on the outskirts of Wolverhampton. But today, some staff did stop to watch. Silly Boris. All Conservative supporters, they were keen to hear what the Prime Minister had to say. But for Millie, it didn't cut it. I'm angry. I think he's broke the rules. Everyone who's broke the rules in government have... Um, resigned and I do think it's time he needs to resign personally. I think he's broke the rules and I think that's what he's got to do. Her colleagues though think he deserves another chance though they are frustrated. Kind of could almost excuse the Christmas event but this like 40 people in a garden no that's not a work meeting or event. Uh, I'm angry with him because it's sad because I really liked him I thought he was doing a good job. I'm not angry about what's happened I'm disappointed that they've had to admit to this. I think all the goodwill that built up is beginning to fade away. I'm still a big supporter, but I think the mood of the country is turning against them. Just over two years ago, this part of Wolverhampton turned to the Conservatives from Labour as Boris Johnson toppled seats across the Midlands and north of England. Now some Tories worry what this politically toxic issue will cost. Some people who voted Conservative for the first time at the last general election say it was the fact Boris Johnson wasn't like other politicians. He didn't play by the same rules as others that was part of his appeal. Now it's that same sense that for some is causing such anger. I can't think. stand him. I mean, How much isn't... longer can he go on saying sorry? So many he times. he isn't really sorry, is he? He wanted to say thank you for all the hard work that was done, and I understand that. But in the light of what was going on in everybody else's home, I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that I would have liked to have said thank you to, but we weren't allowed to uh, gather. Outside the city centre, retailer Mark says he was well supported by the government during the pandemic, but now he's frustrated that while his business was locked up, Others were meeting up. I do feel quite angry about it, really, the way that we've kind of been almost mistreated in a way and kind of, you know, disregarded a little bit, really. You know, I think a lot of local small businesses are very hard working, so it's almost like a kick in the teeth a little bit, really. Winning in places like this is the reason Boris Johnson's been popular within his party. Be in no doubt, if the voters turn away, that support will soon fade too. Alex Forsyth, BBC News, Wolverhampton. Well, let's go live to Westminster and have a word there with our political editor. Uh, Laura, as we heard, the Prime Minister has, of course, um, come back from setbacks in the past. Uh, this time, though, the stakes seem to be much, much higher. You know, it's a terrible position for Boris Johnson and Downing Street to be in, no question about that. You're right, though, to say that Boris Johnson has, if you like, been a sort of big dipper politician. He's had tremendous highs, then tremendous lows, then been able to zoom up back to the top again. But there is a real poison spreading amongst Conservative MPs in the last 24 hours that really calls into question whether that kind of recovery will be possible this time. First off, he knows, he admitted as much at the dispatch box, that there will be millions of people, many of our viewers tonight, who might have listened to him and felt genuine rage about exactly what had been going on in Downing Street during lockdown, during that period of emergency and such pain for many, many millions of people. And second of all, when it comes to his party, 
those people who have the power, if they so choose, to usher him out of office outside of a normal general election. Well, for many Conservative MPs, the question is not whether the status quo can be allowed to continue. It's how and when the status quo can be called to an end. Now, it is important to say there are still MPs who think that Boris Johnson can scrape through this. There are MPs who believe that there could be some comfort for him in the technicality or the formal verdict of the senior civil servant, Sue Gray, who will report on exactly what happened in the next 10 days or so. But in a funny way, the particularities of this party, the particularities of the various shenanigans that may or may not have happened at Downing Street over the last couple of years, seem to have been replaced. They are a proxy now for a long running argument in the Conservative Party that's being fought out again. Is Boris Johnson the right kind of person with the character and integrity to lead the country for number, from number 10? And there are more and more Conservative MPs for whom the answer to that is no. And Boris Johnson, it seems to me, is standing at the edge of a very tall cliff. It is not clear that he will be able to take a step back from this, but it's also not clear if there's anyone in his party yet who will be willing to be the person to give him a shove. But it is a moment of genuine peril for the Prime Minister. There's no question about that tonight. Laura, many thanks again uh, for the analysis there. Westminster, Laura Kinsberg, our political editor. The day's other main story, the Duke of York has failed to get a civil case dismissed in the United States, which accuses him of sexually assaulting a teenage girl. Virginia Giuffray is suing Prince Andrew, claiming that he abused her when she was 17 at the homes of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. The prince has strenuously denied the allegations. But the ruling by the judge in New York means that the civil trial can now go ahead. Our royal correspondent, Nicholas Witchell, has more details. Everything for Andrew had rested on this ruling and it has gone against him. In his 43-page ruling in the case of Virginia Dufre plaintiff and Prince Andrew, Duke of York, defendant, the judge's conclusion was very straightforward. The defendant's motion to dismiss the complaint is denied in all respects, the judge wrote. The possibility of appealing at this stage appears to be remote, so these are Andrew's basic options. He can settle out of court, there'd be no admission of liability, but he would pay a perhaps substantial sum to Virginia Dufre. He can default, that is, ignore the court case, and by default there would be a finding against him. Finally, he could fight it out in court. He'd have to give a deposition under oath, the rival stories would be tested, the matter would be decided in open court. Lawyers who've been following the case say none of the options will be attractive to him. Andrew's got no good options now. He can't make things better. So essentially, I think he's either going to have to engage in the trial process or he's going to have to settle. And that may well be his least worst option. But it would be up to Virginia Dufre to decide whether to accept any out-of-court settlement. At the moment, she doesn't seem inclined to do so. In a statement, her lawyer said, Virginia Dufre is of course pleased that Prince Andrew's motion to dismiss has been denied and that evidence will now be taken concerning her claims against him. She looks forward to a judicial determination of the merits of these claims. All of which leaves Andrew facing the prospect of a bruising court case and the Queen, in this her platinum jubilee year, of enduring months of upset. In his Newsnight interview, the one in which he said he couldn't remember meeting the then 17-year-old Virginia Dufre, Andrew was asked whether he felt his behaviour had damaged the Queen and the royal family. I don't believe it's been damaging to uh, the Queen at all. Has to me. If I was in a position to be able to answer all these questions in a, in a way that gave sensible answers, other than the ones that I've given that, that gave closure, that I'd love it. But I'm afraid I can't, because I'm just as much in the dark as many people. If Andrew does fight on, he'll have to answer all the other side's questions under oath. And he will be able to declare his innocence and his lawyers will be able to test Virginia Dufresne's allegations. But at what price to the reputation of the royal family? As lawyers are saying, he has no good options. Nicholas Witchell.
Well, we'll be talking to Nick in just a second. Before that, let's go live to uh, uh, New York and uh, Neda Tafik is there, our colleague. Uh, Neda, tell us a little more now about the prospects for this legal process and what we're likely to see next. Well, we're waiting to see if Prince Andrew's legal team will attempt an appeal. Now, that would require the judge's permission, and legal experts say that it is a long shot. Now, either way, the arduous discovery process will get underway with deadlines this summer. And that's where each side will have to disclose key information and documents. We already know that Virginia Jeffrey's lawyers have demanded to see Prince Andrew's medical records after he said that her claims have to be false because he cannot sweat uh, claims made in that Newsnight interview. And it's worth noting that if the Duke of York does fight this in court, he will have to sit for a lengthy deposition by Ms. Jeffrey's lawyer, David Boys, a man who is considered one of the greatest trial lawyers in America. He will be asked about private and intimate details of his life under oath. And if this does go to trial, one in the United States of a royal member uh, will certainly spark a media frenzy. So while Prince Andrew has long denied all of the allegations against him, time is now running out to make key legal decisions. Neda, many thanks once again. Neda Taufik there for us in New York. And uh, Nicholas Witchell, our royal correspondent, uh, is with me. Nick, at the end of your report, you included the phrase no good options. It looks like a real mess, doesn't it? I think it does, yeah. Let's start with today's ruling. This is a pretty comprehensive defeat for Andrew. Uh, the clock is now ticking for him to face this civil lawsuit in the United States alleging sexual assault, which he denies. But no good options. If he continues, as Nedo was saying, he will have to give a deposition under oath. He will be cross-examined here in Britain by Virginia Dufresne's lawyers. Most lawyers, I think, would feel that he will have now to seek an out-of-court settlement. But will Virginia Dufre accept such a settlement, or does she now want her day in court? And all of this, Hugh, of course, a couple of days after Buckingham Palace confirmed the programme for the Queen's uh, Platinum Jubilee. Uh, it should be a year when she is able to celebrate and enjoy. But what is the first event of the June weekend? It's Trooping the Colour. Andrew remains the honorary colonel of the Grenadier Guards. He could, if he chose, ride in that parade representing the Grenadier Guards. I think we can say safely that the Grenadier Guards don't want him. But of course, the Queen is reluctant to replace him. It is a monumental mess for Andrew. It is damaging, I think, for the royal family. There is little doubt about that. It is difficult and embarrassing for all those who are involved and there is a real risk that it could get worse. Nick, many thanks once again. Nicholas Witchell there, our Royal Correspondent. Now, the head of the company which owns British Gas has warned that soaring energy costs could be affecting household bills for the next two years. Bills are expected to rise to up to £2,000 per household from April, uh, when a new energy price cap will take effect. The chief executive of Centriga, Chris O'Shea, uh, says there's no suggestion that prices will come down any time soon. He's been speaking to our business editor, Simon Jack. Millions of households may see any disposable income go up in flames this spring as average energy bills rise by an estimated 50%. Households like Sean's in the Forest of Dean. And we're not talking 5, 10, 15 quid here. This is, uh, this is catastrophic, really, for, uh, for me, because I will have no more money in my personal uh, income to do anything. This, this wipes out my spare money. We'll have nothing left. This is no short-term price shock, according to the UK's biggest energy supplier, who says an international scramble for gas means higher prices are here to stay. I can't say that this will be done in six months or nine months, in a year. I can simply look at what the market says at the moment, and the market suggests the high gas prices will be here for the next 18 months to two years. He says customers are rightly concerned and something must be done to protect them. When I talk to our customers, and I hear how distressed they are at the increase in prices that are coming, then I think it's inconceivable that we don't do something to help those people. And when he says we, he, like other providers, is looking mainly at the government. 
Options for the Treasury include scrapping VAT of 5% on energy bills. That would be worth about £100 a year. Quick, easy but blunt, better off households would benefit too. More targeted, reform the warm homes discount. A one-off payment of £140 available to a limited number of people on certain benefits. Make that more generous and widen the eligibility. Then there are green charges on our bills of £170 a year. You could scrap those or move them into general taxation. Maybe fairer because higher earners would pay more. And how to pay for all of this? Maybe a windfall tax on the gas producers making big profits as prices soar. Chancellors, both Conservative and Labour, have done it before. That would deter investment in domestic gas sources like the North Sea, says O'Shea. One way or another, the UK's rising energy bill has to be paid. Ultimately, everybody in the UK is a taxpayer and an energy consumer. So the cost of this is going to have to be paid by UK citizens. The question as to whether that's paid through the energy bill or through general taxation is one for government. The government has promised answers before the new price cap is set in early February. Simon Jack, BBC News. NATO Secretary General has warned that there's still a real risk of new armed conflict in Europe. Jens Stoltenberg spoke after talks with Russia, which left significant differences unresolved. He said NATO was ready for more dialogue over Ukraine, where 100,000 Russian troops have massed at the border. Our defence correspondent, uh, Jonathan Beale, has been following events and joins us now from Brussels. Jonathan, what's your sense of the way that these talks have gone and the prospect of resolving some of these differences? Well, first, the, the talks lasted four hours, longer than expected. But like the talks between the US and Russia early in the week, they ended without break, breakthrough. Both sides not budging on their demands. Now, for Russia... That is a guarantee from NATO not to enlarge. NATO emphatically saying that it will keep the door open for new member states. And for NATO, it's de-escalation. They want to see Russia withdraw the 100,000 troops they now massed on Ukraine's border. No indication that Russia would do that. That is why Jens Stoltenberg said today it was a dangerous situation with a very real risk of a new armed conflict in Europe. That is why the Russians have warned of unpredictable consequences if relations don't improve. The one glimmer of hope is that talks might still continue. NATO's made that offer, Russia's yet to agree. Diplomacy isn't dead yet. That said, the threat of war hasn't gone away either. Jonathan, many thanks for the latest on those talks in Brussels. Jonathan Beale, our defence correspondent. It's time to look at the latest official UK data on the pandemic, uh, showing another fall in new cases. 129,587 new infections in the latest 24-hour period. So 148,357 new cases on average per day in the past week. 19,735 people are in hospital now with COVID, a slight fall since yesterday. And the number on ventilators has also fallen to its lowest since the middle of October. It's just under 800. Deaths have risen again, however. Another 398 were reported of people who died within 28 days of a positive test. And that is the highest for almost a year. On average in the past week, there were 246 related deaths per day. Uh, let's look at vaccinations. Uh, almost 36 million people have had their booster jab now. And that's more than 62.5% of those aged 12 and over. In London, the High Court has ruled that the UK government's use of so-called uh, VIP lanes to award contracts for personal protective equipment to two companies was unlawful. The case was brought by the campaign groups The Good Law Project and Every Doctor, who claimed a hedge fund and a supplier of pest control products were prioritised because of their political connections. Well, our special correspondent, Lucy Manning, has been looking at all of this and she's with me now. Matt, what can you tell us about this case and what led to it? Well, it's all about how the government's been spending money, taxpayers' money, on protective equipment for doctors and nurses, particularly at the height of the pandemic. And for more than a year, we've been revealing that some items like masks and gowns haven't been able to be used in the NHS, despite the government spending hundreds of millions on them. This case specifically, as you say, was about the so-called VIP lane, 
What it meant was that if you're a company trying to bid for these lucrative deals, if you had any in with ministers or MPs or civil servants, then you could get put on the VIP list. It would mean that your bid would get an earlier look. They would look at it earlier. And the campaign group said that was unfair. The judge agreed with them and said that this VIP lane was unlawful, that the two companies, Ianda and Pesfix, that they did get preferential treatment by being on the VIP lane. There is another side to this, as always, with a court case. And the judge did also decide that while they may have got this preferential treatment by being on it, they didn't get the contracts because they were on it. And it's probably likely that they would have got the contracts anyway without the VIP uh, lane. Both sides claiming success, but frankly, it's not a great look for the government that this scheme has been found by the High Court to be unlawful. Lucy, many thanks once again. Lucy Manning there, our special correspondent. Time to look at some football news. Chelsea are through to the final of the Carabao Cup. They beat Spurs 1-0 tonight, 3-0 on aggregate, and they'll face either Liverpool or Arsenal at Wembley next month. Natalie Perks, our sports correspondent, was watching. It is some place to watch. There was optimism in the air at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Their fans believed Spurs could turn this around. But Chelsea were already 2-0 up from the first leg. It would be a long way back for Spurs if they got another. Sorry, got free. Oh, and in. He had a problem on his hands, but in Harry Kane, he has a Rolls Royce of a striker who never squanders chances. Kane nearly had a perfect chance to make amends, though, when Tottenham were awarded a penalty for this. That was until VAR overturned it for being outside the box. It was going to be one of those nights for Spurs. Straight after the break, another penalty given, another penalty overturned. Remarkably, VAR also then wiped out what Harry Kane thought was his landmark 250th club goal for offside. But in truth, Tottenham were second best. Chelsea now head to Wembley, while Spurs fans demand an inquiry into an event where they brought their own booze. Natalie Burks, BBC News. Well, that's it for us now on BBC One. It's time for the news where you are. Have a good night.